Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly call. I'm Rupal. I'm going to start by giving a brief update. 19 has spread, has spread around the world and the subsequent impact on the global economy and markets. Deb will then speak about how alternative investments and how they've been performing in the current market environment. Jim is going to talk about what pension plans can do to help members who are approaching retirement. Guy will be talking about how employers are leveraging their employee benefits to support employees through the current challenging time. And then Mark will finish by talking about the initial, re initial reward leader responses to COVID-19. Please submit any questions you may have during the webinar, and we'll include them on a, a Q&A document a link which will be provided to you after the event. Please feedback any comments or suggestions you might have, and please reach out to any of us if we can be of any help. So turning to my first slide, um, there are two things to note, I suppose, in terms of the uh, uh, outbreaks, uh, the number of cases over the cast last couple of weeks. First is that the number of cases in Italy uh, may have peaked. So the chart in Italy shows the number of daily new cases in Italy going back to the start of the crisis. And they've started to come down, and it's likely they're going to continue to come down, uh, we think, over the next few weeks, as the lockdown has been in place in a, 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 for a considerable period of time. And we may well see similar patterns across the rest of the Europe with a lag of a week or two. Uh, as the lockdown, depending on how long the lockdowns have been in place. In the U.S. on the right-hand side, the number of new cases has surged uh, as they've been initiating their lockdowns very late and until, until recently have had uh, only a limited amount of testing. So the numbers in the U.S. are growing, going up quite alarmingly, and we're likely to see a continued surge in new cases uh, in, the, in, in the U.S., there are sort of three approaches countries are adopting. Uh, the first was the one really that everyone should have done, which is contain it. Um, this is what, uh, contain it, and then track it and test it, which is what has been going on in, in Hong Kong and Singapore and South Korea, where the number of new cases um, has been uh, relatively low, uh, and a degree of economic normality has been allowed to take place. Uh, in other parts of the world, in Europe, in Asia, uh, both, in both places, it's got out of control uh, before they've tried to uh, whack it on the head. Um, and so both places are now, both America and Europe, are playing catch-up, with the goal being to control it, bring the cases down, and then slowly uh, open up uh, and monitor and track the cases until there's a vaccine or treatments in place. Sweden is doing it a slightly different way. They've noted that the mortality rates for children and young people generally uh, is exceptionally low, but is extremely serious for people who are over the age of 80 and those with pre-existing health conditions. So they've encouraged those who are over 80 and those with pre-existing health conditions to stay at home, essentially self-isolate, uh, regardless of whether they have any symptoms or not, uh, don't uh, come in contact with anyone. And for the rest of the population to continue reasonably and normally, with the view that the people who will get it and thus bring up immunity uh, will not will be able to, to fight it off. Time will tell which is the best uh, um, uh, plan of attack. Turning to the next page, I've said this in, uh, in, in recent calls, so I won't repeat it. Uh, we are going to see a huge downturn in economic activity in the second quarter on the right-hand slide, more or less everywhere. So the downturn in the second quarter will be twice as bad as any single quarter in the financial crisis uh, and as bad as anything the GDP terms that we've seen since the Second World War. Thereafter, we would expect some kind of pickup, uh, and time will tell how strong that pickup will be. It's interesting to note on the left-hand side, and this is business confidence uh, from China, uh, is that uh, uh, business confidence collapsed uh, in February, uh, all the way down to, 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 to mid to high 20s on that chart. Um, but the most recent number has rebounded all the way back to 50. And in China, uh, factories have returned to work and the issue for China in the second quarter and later in the year uh, is not uh, the need to shut businesses down, but it's that their exports will be weak because of weakness in the U.S., Europe, and elsewhere. 
The other significant thing uh, that's happened recently is central banks and governments have pledged to do everything it takes to stop businesses from going bankrupt. And there's an interesting quote both from uh, Fed Chair Powell and also the Bank of England saying that they do not want to see a broad range of businesses going bust. And in other statements, essentially saying that businesses that were viable in January should still be viable uh, in July. Uh, and that gives us some comfort that there won't be a broader economic collapse uh, outside and financial collapse uh, outside what is obviously happening uh, to tourism and travel and, and all sorts of things that we can see uh, in our day-to-day -day lives um, from wherever we're locked up. Uh, if we turn to the next page, uh, those pledges of support from governments and central banks have provided some kind of support for markets. So U.S. equities, all these charts are going back 12 months. Uh, on the top left, um, fell by 30, 40 percent um, over the last month and a half. But have had a better week uh, last week or two, uh, even as the number of cases um, have, have, have accelerated rapidly and the, the, the depth of the upcoming recession has been made clear. And that, I think, is because governments um, have said that they are going to step in and support businesses. Um, government bond yields in the U.S. and in the U.K. Um, have, have moved to pretty low levels, uh, reflecting unlimited QE uh, from many central banks around the world. The Chinese equities have outperformed, um, and they've outperformed. They, they fell first. As you can see on the left, um, they've fallen by nothing like as much in, as in the U.S., um, because uh, China appears to be uh, on top of the outbreak in a way that Europe and the U.S. isn't. And credit spreads, which widened very significantly uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, uh, have started to narrow again on hopes and expectations that governments and central banks uh, won't let a whole load of, of businesses, businesses going out. We have an overall neutral view on equities. Um, we, 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 we tend to like emerging markets over developed markets because of China and Asia doing better. Uh, and we, uh, we generally like non-government bonds as well. And at that point, uh, I'm going to hand over to Deb. Great. Thank you, Rupert. And hello to everyone. I hope you're all keeping well. For this next section, I'm going to touch upon what we've been focusing on from an investment perspective over the last week or so. And then I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about alternative investments such as hedge funds and private markets and how they've been performing in this current environment. It's been a challenging few weeks and now months for global financial markets. And as Rupert has highlighted, in response to the events over the last few weeks, we have seen notable government and central bank action to provide support to the global economy. Volatility has remained high is one of the best examples being that the worst week for U.S. equities in over a decade was followed by one of the best in almost a century last week. And daily volatility is no different, as this year we have seen some of the biggest ever one-day moves in the U.S. stock market, both up and down. We have been adjusting a number of things to account for increased volatility within our Mercer portfolios. For example, we have widened rebalancing ranges, and as a result, we are trading a little less frequently, thereby reducing transaction costs. We've also put in place processes to consider trades and trade decisions on a daily basis to help us navigate the best way forward as markets are changing very quickly. At Mercer, we've been increasing the diversification in our portfolios for multiple years now. And we believe that this has resulted in increased resilience, which has been rewarded in this difficult and volatile period, particularly evident in allocations to alternative investments. However, to analyze how alternative investments are performing, it is helpful to remind ourselves of the strategic rationale behind why we allocate. Returning to the next slide, firstly, the theory. By allocating to alternative investments, you are gaining exposure to non-traditional risk factors. Academic theory suggests that adding non-traditional risk factors to a portfolio can increase diversification, lower market dependence, and thereby result in a lower risk portfolio. 
particularly in terms of drawdowns. So that all sounds great in theory, but how have alternative investments delivered recently? In reality, it has been a challenging month, with the speed and level of dislocation in financial markets being extraordinary. But the good news is that we believe diversification is holding up and allocations to alternative investments are providing an important cushion for equity market losses. By design, our alternatives portfolios are providing protection down between a quarter and a third of the drawdowns of equities. However, as mentioned, we are seeing extreme volatility in all asset classes. And this is no different for alternative investments such as hedge funds, where we have witnessed high levels of performance dispersion. One area where we have seen very strong performance is from tail risk hedging strategies. Now, these strategies are designed to generate strong returns during crisis periods when most other risky assets are generating negative returns. Although an allocation to tail risk hedging strategies is usually reasonably small, throughout March, we have seen positive returns of 20 to 40% from these strategies, creating a meaningful positive impact to client portfolios. Insurance link strategies that generate returns by taking on reinsurance risk relating to natural catastrophes are also holding up well, as their returns should not rely on the performance of investment market, making them excellent diversifiers. Alternative investments as an asset type themselves are extremely broad. Even the headline categories of hedge funds, private equity, private debt, infrastructure and real estate really only scratch the surface. At Mercer, understanding these complex investments is a focus when building alternatives portfolios. Indeed, we believe that it is in an environment such as this where the robustness of the portfolio construction framework is tested. And we're pleased to see the strength of our process come through for our clients. Moving on to the next slide, it's important to realize that, of course, there are challenges as well. Focusing on hedge funds in particular, it's worth noting that hedge funds in general are not necessarily hedged, as the name suggests, to a specific market shock, and therefore are not immune from global concerns over the COVID-19 or other uncertainties. It may merit to consider the following. How would you expect your allocations to react in different market environments? And then reviewing them on this basis. Utilizing scenario analysis or stress tests where possible to see if portfolios are behaving as expected. Understanding this in advance and by staying sharp and focused, you are likely to be better equipped to improve decision making. Being aware of behavioral biases such as anchoring or confirmation bias, and also making sure that when analyzing returns, we're looking at them relative to peers or styles. Turning to the next slide, although challenging markets create hurdles, they also create opportunities. And the hunting ground for alternatives is one largely focused on dislocation, mis misrepresentation, or misinterpretation and areas of neglect. Within an allocation to alternative investment, managers are able to take a longer term view while being nimble and exercising patience to capitalize on opportunities. Within markets, there is a strong belief that many investment opportunities could come out of this crisis, particularly in private markets. But patience and selectivity are required given the many uncertainties that still exist. It is likely that this volatile situation is going to be our reality for quite a while. We believe that it continues to support the importance of diversification and, where appropriate, utilizing an allocation to alternative investments within portfolios, particularly in this environment, where there is a large range of potential outcomes and it is unclear how long this market disruption might last. 
I hope that's been a helpful overview of what we've been focusing on from an investment standpoint over the last week or so, and also how alternative investments have been performing. So with that, I'll pass over to Jim for a wealth update. Thank you, Bev, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so over the next five minutes or so, I'd like to look at the measures potentially at the disposal of trustees of defined contribution schemes or just defined contribution schemes generally, be they trust-based or contract-based, to help members who are approaching retirement and who might be understandably concerned at either liquidating or transferring all or a significant proportion of their assets at this time when they have reduced significantly value. And so if we move on to the next slide. So to do that, uh, we look at a typical member whose situation is represented by the pie chart here uh, on this slide. Um, some basic details, the member has a normal retirement age of 65, um, but was intending to retire early at 60. Um, the member's investment allocation is basically a lifestyle investment strategy of the type that's typical in a, uh, in a defined contribution pension scheme, particularly as the default. And it reduces the member's investment risk over the period to age 65 in anticipation of the member drawing down flexibly through retirement. Um, we can see the member situation here where basically 15% of their fund is invested in a cash fund um, and the remaining 85% in a multi-asset fund which will have all of the flora and fauna of the investment universe built into it, but we can simplify its asset allocation by saying that 50% of the member's overall portfolio is in growth assets and 35, sorry, 50% of the multi-asset fund is in growth assets and 35% in defensive assets of the 85% in total. Um, we've assumed that the member has uh, experienced a reduction in value of fund of about 15 to 20 percent this year and therefore has gone from being an enthusiastic retiree to a reluctant retiree as the member anticipates withdrawing from the multi-asset fund uh, during these depleted times. If we just move on now to the next slide. We'll look, thank you, at uh, some of the things that pension plans can do to help a member who finds themselves in this position. Um, and by and large, these measures that we're looking at are based on really helping members to avoid selling assets that have reduced in value. So firstly, we'll look at some benefit withdrawal features that are at the disposal of plans, and plans that don't have these features might consider introducing them and plans that do have these features might want to consider highlighting them, um, and we cover some of them here. So allow members, for example, to extend the period over which they can withdraw cash sums from the pension plan. Many pension plans allow members to withdraw two, three, or four cash lump sums, the so-called UFPLUS or uncrystallized funds pension lump sum that was introduced as part of the freedoms, um, but perhaps if members were wanting to commit less to liquidating assets at this time, plans could look at introducing further off-plus facilities, allowing members many more off-plus withdrawals, um, thereby having to commit less uh, to selling at a particular time. Um, another option might be to withdraw tax-free cash and designate the main funds for drawdown. In other words, um, I know that many pension plans, particularly trust-based pension plans, don't allow drawdown, but it is technically possible to take your tax-free cash and designate the remaining funds for drawdown without actually drawing them down. Um, now, careful legal advice may be appropriate there, at least to ensure that the plan technically can allow drawdown, even if the trustee's policy is not to allow it. But using this approach, um, the member could withdraw the tax-free cash and potentially avoid uh, making any withdrawal from the assets, the, the funds that are in the multi-asset fund, which can then live to fight another day. Um, the partial retirement and partial transfer values might also offer some reassurance to members. In other words, when a member takes retirement, they don't have to crystallize all of their DC funds, uh, but the plan might allow them to crystallize some of their DC funds, again, a partial retirement, or indeed, if they take their benefits out with the environment of the pension scheme, a partial transfer value. And one that uh, I don't want to overemphasize, but it's just worth keeping in mind that technically when a member takes a tax-free lump sum 
uh, they have six months to take the remainder of their benefits and maybe some schemes might want to allow members a little bit more time within that six month window to decide when it is appropriate to take the remainder of their benefits. You have to exercise extreme care with that measure because if the benefits are not, if the remaining benefits are not taken within six months of the lump sum, we can get into unauthorised payment territory with HMRC with potentially very adverse tax consequences. Moving to the next slide, please. Just quickly look at some investment measures. Um, um, so one approach here, if we take this number as an example, and I don't think it's an untypical example, where 85% of the assets are in a multi-asset fund, um, the member might want to maintain the same risk profile that they have currently, but move the assets in the multi-asset fund into discrete funds rather than the single blended fund that they're in at the moment. Um, look at simplistically, the member might say, could I have the money, could I have, uh, of the money that's in the multi-asset fund, could I put the 50% into a separate growth fund and the 35% into a separate defensive fund? Uh, and having done that, the member could then say, I will now withdraw my benefits from the money in the defensive fund uh, and leave the money in the growth fund untouched uh, to allow it time to recover. So in this scenario of putting the member's fund, sorry, the member's savings into discrete funds rather than a single blended fund, the member can be more selective then about where to withdraw benefits from. Uh, if that is combined with the partial retirement measures that I mentioned above, then you can see it could be of great assistance to a member. And finally, to the next and final slide. Worth keeping, again, communication measures in mind, in particular pointing out some of the above options, some of the above flexibilities that may not be front of mind uh, for members when they're retiring. Uh, providing at retirement guidance uh, to employees as well, not necessarily personal financial advice, but guidance um, can also help employees make much better sense of their withdrawal options. Uh, and again, maybe pointing out some areas in which members might wish to take financial advice. For example, they may prefer to borrow against uh, a property or something uh, and have a cash flow in retirement that way while they wait for their investments to recover. These measures aren't completely without risk, of course, but it might be worth something, it might be worth pointing out to members that it's something they could consider. So, uh, with all of that done, uh, I will now pass over to Guy, who will look at how employers are leveraging employee benefits in the current environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we've long talked um, in the health business around really helping employees in those moments that matter. Um, and I think where we look at how benefit technology can support that and in the current situation we now find ourselves in, it's never been more important to make sure that we're sharing relevant content, educational content with employees, um, and it's a, a, a often an opportunity to leverage the technology to do that. And looking at the new working environment we find ourselves in, things like employee assistance programs, virtual GPs, so certain benefits that you may well already have had in place, have really come to the fore in terms of their importance and indeed their relevance um, in these strange times. Um, when we think about the integrity of communications, so a lot of our clients we're working with to either create new sections on their employee benefit uh, sites and specifically to help employees, again, deal with, with the new circumstances we find ourselves in. That could be pulling together different content around physical well-being, uh, mental well-being, financial well-being. Again, I'm sure most people on the call, well-being has certainly come to the fore in recent weeks. Um, and, and it is a great way, again, of, of calling out any provider-specific messages. So we've seen great response from certain providers in terms of how they can better support employees um, through, again, benefits often that you already have and that you're already offering, um, but specific reactions from different providers in, again, these moments that matter to best support members of the different policies. Um, we uh, encourage employers really just first and foremost to keep communicating with people and um, depending again if you've got employee benefit software or actually even if you don't, and um, just looking to pull together as much concise and relevant communications as possible, which of course can be quite difficult as well when things are quite fluid and, and things have well, certainly in the last few weeks seem to be moving pretty quickly. And my final point, and just conscious of time, I'll hand over to Mark in a moment, um, is really just around making sure that you continue to remember to follow those business as usual monthly processes. 
So this could be around processing leavers and joiners into the business, making sure again the right employees are covered by the right benefits and indeed that leavers aren't continued to be covered after they've left. We know there's been a lot of distractions, a lot of tactical um, and pretty unique requirements of the HR team um, over the last few weeks. They've been working hard to react to this situation, but really, really key to not actually forget to do some of the basic monthly processes. And again, if you have benefit software in place, a lot of those will be automated, they will be driven, and frankly, if you just continue to do the monthly process, it will happen as it should do anyway. Um, so yeah, just one point from me again, just to think about any benefits that have been impacted, and so it may be something like the ability to carry over annual, annual leave into a new uh, holiday period, for example. This will vary company by company, um, but it is certainly something we're talking to clients about as well, if, uh, if indeed things aren't acting as they normally would from a benefits perspective. Um, again, conscious of time, um, I'll now hand over to Mark um, to finish up the session. Thanks, Guy. Uh, Jerry, if you could just move to the next slide, that would be perfect. So I'm going to talk about some of the initial market responses to COVID-19 from UK reward leaders. We spent the last couple of weeks um, talking with a wide range of UK leaders of reward and surveying those organisations as to their initial responses. I'm going to talk through some of the immediate actions, the cost-saving measures that are being put in place, and the long-term, longer-term planning which is taking place. As naturally you would expect, um, responses are moving at pace. Um, but what we've also already seen is organisations identifying and understanding the impact on their operations, their overall business goals, and the implications for both individual performance and executive performance measures. In the first instance, what we've seen is immediate actions to adapt to new ways of working. Responses to put the health and wellbeing of people at the heart of the response. What our survey has shown is that sickness policies have typically not been reviewed significantly within larger organisations, with over 75% of organisations maintaining their existing policies, extending that for early um, COVID-19 um, eligibility, and also self-isolation for up to two weeks. For the majority of organisations, we typically see policies covering four to 12 weeks, depending on the level of service and other factors, so um, not a significant change there. Over the last couple of days, we've seen increasing evidence that organisations are looking to significantly furlough parts of their organisations, with around kind of 44 percent of companies saying at least half their staff would be paid through uh, the job retention scheme, according to the British Chamber of Commerce. And from that same survey, 75% of the workforce would be furloughed over the next week um, within those organisations that would be using that measure. We've looked at other cost-saving measures that organisations have been putting into place. When we look at the largest cost, the fixed pay and the salary, 60% of organisations that we've surveyed said that they would continue with their existing pay review at this point in time. For the third of organisations that are planning to stop or defer their pay review, we see split practice between basically um, that review being put back by a number of months and the commitments being made or the review being halted in its entirety. What we've seen is um, a focus on uh, in, basically uh, reducing fixed costs, and that's likely to continue. Um, despite that, what we've seen is um, on the 1st of April, the legal minimum rise in the minimum wage by 6% has been um, put into place as well. On broader interventions, um, we've seen organisations prioritising actions which minimise the, the longer term impact on their workforce. The main responses being implementation or consideration of headcount freezes, voluntary unpaid leave, and bonus cuts, with around 35% of organisations seriously considering or already implementing bonus cuts. Whilst it's very early to say, um, we're seeing um, organisations typically identify that salary cuts um, on a permanent basis mandatory unpaid leave and redundancy whilst those remain options are not at front of mind at this point in time. 
the focus remains on actions to preserve the health of the workforce and ensure that organisations can continue and manage their cash. As we start to identify that the crisis is going to continue for a significant period of time and the situation evolves, we're seeing organisations shift from crisis management to preparation for a longer term downturn. What we would expect to see is business transformation will move up the agenda and as new ways of work, working become embedded, we'd expect organisations to be accelerating the actions to support and prepare themselves for the future of work, including focusing on reskilling and multi-skilling, designing pay to support agility, innovation, and further reinforce the importance of the overall organization's EVP and overall employment value proposition. With that, I'll hand back to Rupert to close the session. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for joining the call. We really do appreciate your time, so I'm sure you're, you're extremely busy. I hope you find today's discussion helpful, and hope you're able to join us at the next webinar on Thursday, 9th of April. Bye.